Hello everyone, uh, good morning, welcome to Learn with Lorna. Uh, I'll get started in a couple of minutes. So welcome to uh, this week's Learn with Lorna, the 43rd in the series. Uh, this week we will be looking at Lochaber in the 1940s, 50s and 60s. Um, I hope you're all well. I hope you have all got better weather than we do. It's absolutely blowing a gale here. So um, thank you, for, uh, Eleanor. Yes, I've had a good week. I've had a better week than last week. Thank you very much for asking. Um, so my name, uh, for those of you who haven't been involved in these talks before, my name's Lauren Steele. I am the Community Engagement Officer for the Highland Archive Service. As you'll know if you've watched this uh, series before, the Highland Archive Service has four offices. The Hub Archive Centre in Inverness, the Highland Archive Centre, the Sky and Loch Alsh Archive Centre in Portree, Loch Abbott Archive Centre in Fort William, and uh, Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness Archives uh, up in Wick. Trying to look at collections across all of them, and this week I'm going to look at some from uh, some items from Loch Abbott Archive Centre. And that's to tie in to the decades theme that all of our archive centres have been looking at over the past few weeks and to tie in some of the posts that you've maybe seen on Loch Abbott's page if you uh, follow that one. These talks always are broadcast live across all four of our archive service pages so I'm never sure which page people are uh, going to be watching on so uh, if you uh, have followed our Loch Abbott page then you'll have seen some of this information before. A reminder before any, I go any further that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland. I, High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to the viewer to take part in these uh, in these events. But if you're able to donate, then we appreciate that. And I really appreciate those of you who've been able to do so. Thank you so much. Um, a lot of the time, inevitably and, and, and understandably, people associate archives with the long distant past. Um, we our collections cover from the from 1299 onwards, so we cover the reigns of about 30 monarchs of Scotland and then of Britain. Um, so a huge a huge swathe of information and a time period in which there have been just innumerable uh, changes and and changes in our in our way of running a country, religion, uh, art, society, absolutely everything. And so archives have many and various functions. And what I'm going to do, hopefully over the next um, week or two, is put together just a, a really brief questionnaire to, set, to send out to you guys to see what, what it is you uh, are using these talks for, are you using them for research or that sort of thing. So obviously people come to us to research in our collections. They come to find out about um, the long distant past, whether that's um, a subject, an era, a person, things like that. They use them to learn. We use them to teach. Uh, people use them to compare different uh, periods of history and find out the, the difference between things that are happening. They're used for evidence, and this is something that people uh, sometimes don't really think about. And I have a couple of things to say about that before I go on to the subject. One is that a quote that uh, I heard from a gentleman called John Peelan, who some of you may be familiar with, who is um, the head of the Scottish Council on Archives. And he said at a conference I was at one day, archives are the bedrock of your life, whether you know it or not. And I've maybe I've quoted that one here before because I find it a really uh, interesting sentence that archives underpin all of our lives. You know, they dictate where schools are built, how housing standards are uh, adhered to. Um, all sorts of things are governed by archival material, whether people realise that or not. Um, but the other thing that we sometimes use archives for, and this was the reason that we've chosen decades for January's theme across our Facebook pages, it's another important side to archives, which is to use them for reminiscence, to prompt memories, um, to gather our collective memory together, to, to share things with each other, to encourage a sense of community and to have fun. Um, I know I've spoken before in this series about times that I've worked with school groups to write, to do creative writing or art projects, things like that. 
and across all of our offices we've used our collections. Last week was a great example, Operation Snowdrop, um, where people, there were so many memories of people writing about, oh, my father was involved in this, my mum did this, those sorts of things. And so archives have that really powerful uh, ability to connect with our recent past as well. If you're interested in, in this as a subject, and I find it completely fascinating, so I hope someone is, um, then there's two places I would recommend you go. The Scottish Council on Archives, which is an umbrella organisation for archives in Scotland, have produced a film called Why Archives Matter. So you can have a wee look at that and that will tell you some of the reasons that, that people use archives. Um, and another thing I would recommend to look at if you're interested in the subject is a report by Patricia Kaczynski and Jeff Krosick, uh, which is about the cultural value, understanding the cultural value of archives. What does engagement with archives give people and what does that then in turn give community? And that's available online, uh, Jeff Crossick's report. So please do have a look at that if you're interested in doing so. So we've used our archive collections over the years, but also particularly during lockdown. We've produced packs for befrienders groups, for care homes. We've encouraged people and things like that. And so as I say, that was kind of the, the reasoning for our starting this year with Decades on Facebook to show some of our more recent collections, to prompt some memories and some conversations. I think those things are really powerful in hard times like the times we're living in at the moment. Going back to a place that um, is happy or you have memories of is, is a powerful thing and finding connections with other people. Um, so this week we're going to look at some records from this uh, idea, this this theme, going to collections in Loch Abbott Archive Centre dating from the 1940s, 50s and 60s. So if you lived in the area or visited the area or, or have any connection with it, then please I'd really encourage you to share your memories on here and you'll probably find that people have similar memories even if they haven't been to this area. Okay, so yes, Fiona, I'm seeing your comment. I will post links for the film and the report into the comments when I finish the talk, no problem at all. Okay, so starting in the 1940s, obviously the dominant thing of the 1940s was World War II, and I have talked about this in various sessions. And as I've mentioned in previous sessions, for Loch Aber, something very substantial uh, in about World War II in the 1940s was the commando training in Loch Aber and the requisition of many buildings. So there are documents in the collections there that talk about the upheaval that was caused by the war. So things like letters of buildings being requisitioned to be used for military uh, purposes. There are also documents that show how the local authority and other organisations coped and adapted. So things like borough minutes, county minutes that talk about the, the things, the systems that were put in place to cope with extraordinary circumstances. There are documents that record the evidence uh, uh, that evidence the impact on people's everyday lives. So things like uh, the document I've spoken about before, Mrs. Pauline Cameron Heads uh, of Inver Alert, her documentation for becoming an ambulance driver, something which, you know, was very unlikely to have happened 20 years earlier, but because there was a war, these things change and impact people's everyday lives. There are letters, there are ration books, things like that. But also there are documents that should give evidence to how daily life and events continued despite global upheaval. And I'll, I'll come back to that because I think that's a really interesting and current theme. For instance, we have valuation rolls that run right through the World War II period that record information on the rateable value of each property. So their, their very existence proves the fact that everyday life was continuing. People were still gathering this information and recording it. Um, so those those valuation rules kind of sh they prove evidence they give evidence of military uh, presence in the area of requisition things like that but as I say they also show normal everyday lives going on and as I say even the fact that, that they were still collected and compiled uh, shows those two things running in parallel. School logbooks and admission registers are another great example of this if you ask any of my colleagues they'll say famously there are school logbooks which go right through World War One and World War Two with no mention at all, like it just it was absolutely irrelevant. Um, so it's interesting, and of course you know that it's not irrelevant to them, they're living through it, 
but it doesn't stop the need for daily life to go on. Uh, again, the continuation of normality against global chaos background. And so I wanted to read some extracts to you from Glenn Finnan's school logbook from 1944 and 45, just to, to prove more about what everyday life was like. So starting on the 9th of October 1944, and it, these are just some random extracts. Two children from Corrie Bui, from whom the pa for whom the passenger train makes two halts daily, were admitted today. Interesting. Um, I wonder if there are still many places where a train makes a specific stop to drop children off to school. I know there are some. Uh, October the 27th, one child unable to attend school for want of footwear. That's something that maybe we would associate much more with 100 years earlier. This is 1944. October the 31st, supply of coal, two tonnes delivered today. So the coal to keep the uh, classrooms warm. In my time, we still had a, a, a fireplace in our uh, primary school. I was at Alvey Primary School. We still had a, a fireplace in the room, but no uh, but no fire. And as someone who shifted about a tonne of logs yesterday, I can sympathise with these people and their two tonne of coal. Uh, the next week, another child absent for want of footwear. So it's obviously relatively common. Going into December, uh, double marked today as children were taken to Fort William to see the film Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The school was closed for the Christmas vacation. Percentage of attendance has been very low owing to one child being absent all term suffering from impetigo and a family attending badly owing to difficulty in obtaining suitable footwear to go to school. You know, these are, these are everyday crises that people are facing with a backdrop of a big crisis behind them. Um, another entry talks about severe snowstorm and children unable to get to the school. Uh, and one in February says the Callop Bridge was carried away by the thaw flood. And so some children have been unable to attend until the bridge is repaired. I just find that very, very interesting that right now, of course, we are living through a, a period of global upheaval, global difficulty, and the archives are still being, being produced at the moment, which we still accession, we still gather them, we still actively keep them, which will show the attempts to adapt internationally, nationally, locally to the crisis we're living through. So there will be council records, government records, local organisation records, staffing records that show um, the impact that a crisis can have at every level of a, of a community's organisation, but also evidence of everyday life continuing alongside. Um, school, you know, the school records at the moment will be very different in the UK because schools are not operating in anywhere like normal. Um, but the, the organisations that are being impacted at the moment, like businesses, churches, the NHS, are all records that we keep and that we look back on. Um, and so it will be interesting in the future to look back on those. If you remember right at the beginning, nearly a year ago, I mentioned how much we would appreciate people keeping diaries. And I know Fiona and some other people have continued to do so. Those things will be vital in the future for us to see the backdrop. 28,000 words and counting, Fiona. Good woman. Thank you. So there's uh, some thoughts about the 1940s. Uh, a reminder before I go into the next two decades that this series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these films. So going on to the 1950s, and I'm going to preface this by saying, of course, I am picking very, very few examples from a long period of time where much will have happened. Um, and I'm sure that there will be people who will remember lots of things that I don't mention. But just to, to give some examples of, of types of things in the collections, really. So 1950s, obviously post-war. Um, this is a mixture of looking forward, I think, as a decade. People who have lived through it, please correct me if I'm wrong. But my feeling from my parents and from for other things is that this was a mixture of a, a decade where people were looking forward, the war was behind them, but also a period of seeing the devastation all around them, buildings that are bombed out, um, people who have been lost. And I think for children growing up in the 1950s, probably not fully understanding the lives their parents have just lived through. Um, 
I may be wrong with that, but that's my, my gut feeling. And of course, this is the period where we start to get the baby boomers. So this is when the, uh, a great increase in the population. I think often the 50s are, are looked back on as kind of halcyon days, um, especially to, to grow up in. Like I say, that's because the, the, the war is behind you. So our records show uh, local and national events, and I'm going to focus on just two examples of these. The construction of the Commando Memorial in 1952 and uh, the marking of Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953. Um, obviously, no decade stands in isolation. You know, we think of these very clear cut periods of 20s, 30s, 40s, but, you know, life doesn't change on uh, with the turning of a calendar. Um, and so the events of the 1940s hugely impacted life of the, in the 1950s, uh, opinion, both physically and, and kind of uh, emotionally, so mentally, opinions, buildings, lifestyles, things like that have all been changed because of what came before. So the fact that the Commando Memorial was born, it uh, was created, sorry, I'm reading and typing the word, uh, that, saying that she was born then, so I'm saying the wrong thing. Um, the the fact that the Commando Memorial was built in the 1950s was only because of what had happened with the commandos in the 1940s. Um, it was constructed in Spain Bridge. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with it. It's a well-known and well-loved landmark that has a lot of significance and memories for a lot of people. It's something um, that is a, an important monument to locals, an important uh, monument to tourists and also somewhere that is frequently still visited by those who have served uh, in the armed forces. It depicts three giant figures in bronze. Uh, they're in battle dress with uh, woolen caps and climbing boots and they're looking across the Great Glen where they undertook their basic commando training. Um, the monument is 17 feet tall uh, and was designed by Scott Sutherland from Dundee College of Art designed in 1949 and unveiled by Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, in 1952. Uh, it's cited there, it is indeed, Leslie, a very emotive uh, monument, yeah. Uh, cited there because the World War II troops, uh, in World War II troops arrived at Spian Bridge to begin their commando training. And so I wanted to read to you just an extract of the sort of planning that goes into that kind of thing from the, um, Borough, the Borough of Fort William Minutes from September 1940, uh, 1952. So it says here, uh, Jen, Jenny, just before I read that, the Commando Mon uh, Monument is in Spian Bridge. If you have a look at our Ambala website, you'll see some uh, nice pictures of it. But if you just Google it, you'll see some pictures. Um, Commando Memorial. Red letter of the 16th alt from Lord Lovett regarding the visit of the Queen Mother to unveil the Commando Memorial on the 27th. Lord Lovett suggests that the council might associate itself with the ceremony, and it was decided that the provost and, and ex-provost Cameron should meet him on the site tomorrow at 11 a.m. to discuss the arrangements for the ceremony. As at present uh, advised, as at present advised, the town council would be prepared to bear the expense of a service of buses between Spian Bridge Station and the site, and would ascertain the names of householders in the borough who are prepared to offer hospitality to the commandos who are attending the function. In regard to canteen arrangements, Captain Mackenzie of the Grand Hotel has kindly consented to accompany the council's delegate and give advice to the committee on this matter. So this is just the um, the day-to-day, -day, the practicalities of erecting, putting up a monument that links back to the 1940s will last as a legacy of what the area contributed to uh, World War II and as I say, is, is somewhere that is still certainly a very um, important place, particularly, I think, to those who have served uh, in the military and in the commandos is somewhere that they still gather for um, uh, at uh, remembrance. Um, I'm just seeing lots of discussion coming up about recording. Yes, please do, if you're able to record an interview with, with a, a, a relative who, who has memories of an area, please, please try and do it. But I understand how difficult that is at the moment. The next year, June 1953, I'm hoping to get some memories coming up on here. Um, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. A lot of people remember this. This is a big occasion. It's one of those things that you remember because it's so different from every other normal day. Huge increase in TV watching and purchase, days off school, 
uh, coronation mugs, events, uh, all sorts of things. So if you have any memories of that, please do uh, type them up. And as I say, I'm quite sure other people will chip in, even if they're from a different part of the country, they'll have a memory of it as well. So how was this big event marked in Loch Aber? So I wanted to read to you just an absolutely typical in extract from a school logbook. This, I'm going to say Boonavillan. If anyone is from there and I have pronounced that wrong, I apologise sincerely. That's on the Morven Peninsula in Loch Aber. And this is a school logbook that records what happened in the school for the coronation. And like I say, I think it's probably fairly typical. So, uh, 1953, holidays for the coronation of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. June the 4th, school reopened today. On coronation day, June the 2nd, the souvenir mugs gifted by the Education Authority to the school children were distributed at the sports field at Loch Allen, where sports were held for the Morven schools. The Morven Coronation Fund Committee filled the mugs with sweets. So I think that is that seems from what I've seen to be fairly typical of the sort of things. Days off, um, sports, games, the coronation mug, uh, gifts, sweeties, things like that. So that's what happened at many schools. What happened in Fort William to mark the coronation? Well, I think one of the most unusual things maybe is Operation Benfire. I love this. I hadn't come across this until very recently. This was the construction of a bonfire on the top of Ben Nevis. And I wanted to read to you an extract from uh, the visitor book from the Ben Nevis Observatory, which is from uh, the West Highland Museum collections that we look after. And this talks about how they went about preparing to build a bonfire on the top of Ben Nevis to celebrate the coronation. So, the weather was very bad. Deep snow, frozen hard, covered the summit. There was a continuous gale and a blizzard and intense cold. There was mist from the 2000 foot level, so the bonfire was visible only to those on the summit. Now, I may cruelly say that's fairly typical Fort William weather. Um, the radio equipment, weighing in all nearly a quarter of a ton and manhandled up and down, was set up inside the shell of the observatory from which the broadcast was made. But for this shelter, but for this shelter, it would have been impossible. The bonfire material was some 200 dry snedded trees, which means they're pruned and the branches taken off, uh, 10 to 15 feet long from the forest of Glen Nevis, kindly supplied by the Forestry Commission. All were carried to the top by willing, enthusiastic volunteers of all ages during the three weeks preceding the event. On May the 27th, the Fort William School was given a holiday and all of the pupils and teachers turned out and carried all the material up to halfway. It was just such keenness which made this undertaking a memorable reality. The whole operation was filmed by G.W. Scott Esquire. Now, does that film still exist? I don't know. I had a very quick look before I came on, just this morning before I came on here to see if I could see it. Um, I'll maybe get in touch with the... the um, uh, Kelvin, uh, Kelvin Grove, the, the film archive, and see if they know of anything of it. It was also broadcast on the radio. Uh, it was the first such broadcast ever attempted and was successful, was heard all around the world. Uh, it was lit at 9pm on June the 2nd. Uh, as I'm reading that, uh, I'm thinking, I wonder how exciting it is to hear an, a radio broadcast of a bonfire that you can't see. But I'm sure there were speeches and other things. So those uh, are just some examples from the 1950s. If the 1950s was seen as a bit of a, a decade of freedom and, and turning away from the war, the 1960s, of course, is famous for being a decade of, of freedom and change. There are some fantastic pictures on Umbala of the 1960s, of Fort William, of, of all sorts of other places. And often when we post these sorts of things from 60s, 70s, 80s, they prompt huge conversation and discussion because, of course, they contain uh, cars. Cars is a big thing that always uh, prompts discussion. Clothing, um, buildings, things like that, that some might be the same, but some uh, are very much different. But I wanted to uh, kind of round off this bit about the 60s by talking about one of the most fantastic resources from the 1950s and 1960s is the third statistical account. 
The first statistical account, which kind of summarises each parish, gives a description of the geography of the flora and fauna, of the types of people, the work, things like that. First edition was produced in the 1700s, second edition produced in the 1800s. And if you can join me next week, I'll be looking at the sort, uh, some of the online resources that you can use to do some archive research while the buildings are closed. Um, so I'll talk more about statistical accounts next week and they really are fantastic. So I hope you can join me for that. So that's the first and the second edition. The third edition um, were produced in the 1950s, it revised 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and they contain just all sorts of information. And as I say, for the, the third edition are great for prompting memories of businesses that used to exist, of schools, doctors, things like that. Earlier ones give uh, information that can be quite hard to find anywhere else, but the third ones um, are great for, for recent memory. But all three of them are fantastic for opinions. And we'll, I will definitely find some great opinions for you next time about the type of people to be found in each parish. So I wanted to round off by reading some extracts to you from the 1960s. One from Kilmanivig, uh, which is, I think, quite topical, uh, and one to finish off from the parish of Glenelg. So for Kilmanivig, I wanted to read from the education section of the statistical account and from the Glenelg I'm reading from the leisure activities and way of life section. Uh, and no, as far as I'm aware, the third edition is not available online. We have complete copies of them uh, and there are copies in each of our um, in each of our archive centres. But no, as far as I'm aware, the third edition is not online, the first and second are. OK, so this first uh, example I want to read to you is from the Kilmany Vig um, statistical account written in the 1960s about education. The subjects taught and the methods of teaching have changed considerably here over the last hundred years. In advanced education, science has taken precedence over classics and indeed so have modern languages and commercial subjects. Only a small number of secondary school pupils take Latin and hardly any take Greek. On the other hand, nature study, history, geography, gardening, handicrafts, cookery and elementary science are used very successfully as media of education, while music is employed to brighten the inevitable routine. It is deplored, however, that very few pupils in all of the schools of this parish have Gaelic for their mother tongue, so that the teaching of it has completely ceased. Occasionally, a Gaelic class is started privately, but it soon fades away as difficulties begin to be encountered, which require resolution and patience to overcome. The provision of a midday meal for children at a very reasonable cost is undoubtedly one of the best things ever done in connection with education. Its effect is obvious in the physique and the vigour of the children, while their training in table manners under supervision of the teachers is likewise of importance for their future. Just interesting to see, uh, as I say, something that's certainly quite current uh, in the UK, the importance of, of school meals. So that's the sort of thing. And it's, it's interesting to see. I think sometimes we are anyone who knows me well will, will, will know I, I bang on about this a lot. I think as human beings, there's a real tendency that we have to think the way we've grown up is the way it's always been. Um, and actually, we find through documents like this that nothing has been constant for long. That's them just a few, you know, relative comparatively a few years ago, talking about the complete change in education um, and how, whether that's as a positive or a negative impact. You know, nothing stays the same uh, and nothing is the right way just because it was the way when we were growing up. <laughs> um, and it's it's interesting to, to use these documents to compare those things. Um, and I want to uh, round off by reading you a fantastic extract from the Leisure Activities and Way of Life section of Glenelg Statistical Account from 1964. So they say here, there are halls in Glenelg, Morer and Malig, the one in Glenelg being the gift of the late Honourable uh, Walter Stewart, Master of Blantyre. Active measures are being taken to improve community facilities such as playing fields. The Scottish Council of Social Service, while making a survey of the North, got the impression that this was a district which is optim optimistic about its future. There are drama groups and branches of the Women's Rural Institute. Football as a game has superseded Shinty, and in 1951, the Glenelg team won the McLeod Challenge Trophy. Many homes now have a radio, 
and programmes in Gaelic and English helped to enliven the long winter nights. And this is interesting. So this is Glenelg as opposed to Kilmanivig, which are not you know, hugely far apart. Gaelic is still spoken here by young and old, and night classes are held to help those who wish to have a better acquaintance with their native language and to be able to sing Gaelic songs. The young, the majority of whom have known Gaelic from infancy, are keenly interested in its preservation. And common Gaelic has a branch in the parish and the, Ga the Gaelic choir can always be relied on to make the concert, any concert a resounding success. The Cayley is not by any means a thing of the past in this area. I love the way he rounds this, this section off. The date of the last statistical account was 1836, and this is 1964. Almost 130 years of unparalleled progress and emancipation have rolled by, and a deep and ever-widening gulf separates those two eras. How difficult it is to believe that in 1836 there were no motor cars, no telegraphs, no telephones, no gramophones, and no aeroplanes. Even the bicycle was unknown. Slow as it now seems compared uh, to those now acquainted with jet propulsion, the push bike when it first appeared on country roads was so much of a sensation on account of its speed that it was looked upon as an, ex an invention of the Prince of Darkness. One day, an old Highland woman standing in the doorway of her cottage in Skye saw a cyclist suddenly appearing round the bend of a highway a few hundred feet away. Great was her excitement uh, as she called her husband Come out here, quick, quick, the devil is coming down the road riding a spinning wheel, and if you don't hurry, he'll be in Harris before you get a glimpse of him. The old order is gone, we do not wish it back. Gone too from our glens, we hope, is the glim grim spectre of want which has long haunted them. Although certain parts of our parish still require better houses, roads and sanitation, all the signs of a new age are everywhere conspicuous. Today, aged and lonely people no longer able to look after themselves are well cared for in their own homes. Cases of sickness or accident, even from the most remote corner of the parish, can be conveyed in comfortable ambulances to Inverness Hospital within a few hours. Most farmers own cars. The cinema, it's true, is still out with the bounds of this parish, but it's not greatly missed, while whist drives and dances are run so frequently. And for those fond of reading, the county library visits places with an excellent selection of books. And he finishes with the sentence, one wonders what the fourth statistical account will look like. Now that we are living in the atomic age, the question arises, will it be a record of still greater achievement or retrogression to Paleolithic conditions? Who knows? Who knows if there will ever be a fourth statistical account or if there was what it would say. Um, Claire, I'm seeing your comment there about um, the statistical accounts being patronising, I, I completely agree with you. The first statistical accounts can be, um, they, they can sometimes show the education, they can sh sometimes show the opinions and the type of person who has written them. Uh, and so they can give opinion about the character of people, um, which we would maybe take ex exception to, I, I agree with you. Um, but nevertheless, they are such a fantastic resource, uh, source of information. Uh, Val, yes, I agree. That's beautifully written for an official document, isn't it? I, I was just quite uh, taken with it when I read it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this look through some of the documents that relate to our more recent history, the 40s, 50s and 60s uh, in Lochaber. I hope you can join me next week. I'll be looking at online resources, including our own online catalogues, um, our uh, blog posts on our Nucleus page, Ambala, but also other uh, websites, other organisations that can help you do some research at this time where you're not able to get into most of our, our buildings, certainly uh, in the UK. So I hope you can join me next week. Please do have a look at the upcoming talks that are advertised. I've, I've put the next few in so you can have a wee look at those uh, and then I'll get on to do the following ones. And also we've got a series of family history classes coming up being run by my colleague Anne Fraser, who some of you will know knows everything to do with family history. So if you're interested in taking part in those family history uh, classes, if you scroll back down our Facebook page, there's a poster there uh, that gives all the details about that. Thank you for joining me and uh, I'll see you next week. And a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these, but we really 
really appreciate any donations that you're able to give towards our work. Thank you.